I'm Emily. And I'm Hannah. We are best friends and dietitians. We have a goal of challenging nutrition misinformation and fitness trends with an evidence-based approach. Each episode, we will dish up our thoughts about the latest facts on a popular health-related topic. We're the Upbeat Dietitians. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Upbeat Dietitians podcast. Today, we are joined by Lauren Link, who Emily and I worked under at Purdue. She is a registered dietitian in Burt Bird, board certified specialist in sports dietetics. I'm leaving that in just to make everyone <laughs> laugh. She is the director of sports nutrition at Purdue University, where Emily and I went to school. And when Lauren was there as a student, she played women's soccer and was part of the 2007 Big Ten Tournament Championship team. As an undergrad, she completed a dual degree in dietetics and nutrition, fitness and health, and later completed her master's from Purdue in health and kinesiology. Lauren began her professional career as a clinical dietitian with St. Vincent's Hospital before returning to her alma mater in 2014 as the program's first full-time sports dietitian. As the director of sports nutrition at Purdue, she oversees all sports nutrition operations and staff and works directly with football, men's basketball, soccer, and volleyball. Outside of her work at Purdue, she also sits on the board of directors for the Collegiate and Professional Sports Dietitians Association and is currently the vice president. In 2017, she published her first book, The Healthy Former Athlete. We're so excited to share this episode with you, and we hope you enjoy. Enjoy. Lauren, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. We are so good to see you guys again. Yes, you too. We are so excited (laughs) to have you on. So today we want to go into something Lauren always talks about on social media called marketing madness, and we'll get into where you come up with that idea, what it is and all of that in a second. But we like to first have our guests walk us through like a day in the life, what you're doing for work, education, hobbies, all that fun stuff. So give it to us if you will. All right. So, I mean, a day in the life of a sports dietitian is a little bit crazy and no day is really the same. Um, so I am currently the assistant athletics director for sports nutrition at Purdue University. Um, and I oversee our staff of sports dietitians, which is about to be five of us total. And our jobs entail lots of different things, basically anything pertaining to nutrition for our athletes, we're kind of leading that charge. So lots of one-on-one counseling, and um, that can be about lots of stuff. Some of it is performance related, like hydration or fueling. Uh, some of it is medical nutrition therapy. You know, we have athletes with diabetes, we have athletes with GI issues, with food allergies, you name it. So lots of medical nutrition therapy. Um, We would meet with our athletes about body composition. We have a DEXA machine. I don't know how many listeners are dietetic folks. Um, So maybe people don't care about what a DEXA is. But anyway, um, we do lots of food service. So we have fueling stations, uh, which are kind of like snack bars on crack or something. Um, Dining hall for our athletes. We do menu planning. We travel with the athletes. Um, You know, we're on the sideline at games, we're at practices, depending on what team it is and, and how in-depth our support might be, um, just depending on the needs of that sport. Some are a little needier than others. So all that to say, any day in the life is just going to be some combination mismatch of those things. Um, so it's a lot of fun and it takes a lot of uh, hours for sure. Um, so we, we work a lot of hours but I do, I feel like I have pretty good work-life balance and time for hobbies. I mean, you mentioned like hobbies and things. I have a 11 month old daughter who's pretty freaking cute. And, um, so I like spend time with her, my husband and I like to travel. We like craft beer and food. Um, I feel like kind of your standard foodie stuff. So I don't know if that hit everything, but that's my, my nutshell answer. I think you definitely knocked them all out very well, but yeah. Hannah and I actually worked under Lauren for a little bit. So we had the pleasure of watching your chaotic life (laughs) as you went by and seeing the snack bars on crack. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. And you guys were an integral part of making those function. Our students are the best. We could not do it without our students. Cool. So let's give the audience though, kind of why they're here today. And I feel like you are the, I, 
I feel like there's a social media term like CEO of, I would call you the CEO <laughs> of marketing madness and <laughs> breaking down nutrition misinformation around like all those flashy food labels and whatnot. So kind of walk our listeners through what exactly is marketing madness and then what was your inspiration behind it? Kind of what, I don't even know, Hannah and I have followed you online for so long, but I don't know if either of us were really aware of your first marketing madness post. So kind of walk us through that entire process. Sure. So for one, I'm totally taking the CEO title um, and running with that. Um, the first time I used marketing madness, it was not in any attempt to make it like my big thing. Um, I was kind of just stuck on like, I didn't have a lot of great ideas for content. And I was walking to the grocery store. And I'm pretty positive in saying my first ever one was like a bougie lunchable. I can't even remember what brand it is. Um, But I just remember like looking at it and thinking like, really like that looks kind of like a normal lunchable but it was you know like matte cardboard and um very natural looking and it had words like natural and um I don't know what else was on there but I remember thinking like okay I roll that's ridiculous you know like that's ridiculous and then I so I picked it up I picked it up in the store and I looked at that compared to a normal lunchable and they were like basically the same um And it just struck me of like, oh my gosh, there's so many moms probably walking around the store paying, you know, 150%, 200% more for this bougie looking Lunchable when, and thinking that like, oh, wow, I'm so healthy and my kid's getting this premium product and really it's the same and it's all marketing. So that was kind of my unplanned like launch into marketing madness. And at first, again, I didn't really think it would be like a whole big thing, but I, you know, Ben was trying to kind of look, but so now my eyes are peeled a little bit of like, okay, what else is out there? And then I found like, oh my God, it's literally everything. Like every stupid thing in the store is wildly marketed and there's no regulation around it either, which we, we know as dietitians. Um, and I, I include a little bit about that piece of stuff in my book. So I had done um, a little bit of work with that in the past and it just like all kind of came back to light for me I was just like oh my gosh like all these words mean nothing but that's why people are buying them and they're paying more um for nothing else or certainly not anything notable um so yeah so that's how it started um and I think you asked me to say what it is which we've probably kind of alluded to but essentially just calling out companies and or products um for using mark misleading marketing um whether it's words whether it's claims and you know there are rules around what you can claim a product does or doesn't do but um outside of a few rules there are not many uh so there's you know there's nothing regulating terms like all natural and um oh gosh even some things like cage free and you know whatever i can't i'm doing a terrible job thinking of examples farm raised um mom approved doctor approved no regulations around that. Um, and but people notice that stuff. So anyway, it, it's my attempt at trying to bring some light to those topics and just point out how similar a lot of those things are to their kind of peasant counterpart um, and or just how full of shit they are. And to clarify, this is like mostly food products too, like supplements are a whole other ball game where there's even less regulation. So if you can imagine foods have this much like confusion around them, imagine supplements being their own other like wild, wild west. But yeah, anyway, um, Emily and I always joke about how like the most seemingly silly things we post about are often the ones that like get the most views and attention and take us into the CEO status of said topic. Like right now, I'd say on TikTok, I'm like the CEO of watermelon. It's like my thing right now for like the dumbest reason, like the most dumb video I put the least amount of work into went viral and now it's like all I'm talking about so it's just so funny how social media works but thank you for sharing all that I um I always love hearing like the becomings of how you became the CEO of marketing (laughs) madness so I think we've touched on this but any other thoughts on 
like the big negative impacts of all this misleading marketing on our groceries and or supplements, but mostly groceries as we're kind of talking about food mostly today. Yeah. Uh, so I, I do want to like acknowledge what you said about supplements, like, oh my gosh, that could be a whole like thing in itself. And if, if food is sketchy, like supplement and food's not that sketchy inherently, but marketing around it is, um, but yeah, supplements are like times a thousand. Um, but food specifically, I would say some of it's like pretty harmless. You could argue like, what's, what's the big deal? Um, because it is still food. So at least unlike supplements, we're not concerned that it maybe has scary ingredients in it or that there's not enough of a, um, efficacious dose or, you know, something like that. But I think the harm is a couple of things. One, especially right now, while food is freaking expensive. Um, I mean, food insecurity is real, as we all know, and dietitians, I think, especially know that in the work that we do. But the fact that people are paying more for a largely similar product is kind of messed up, you know. And if, you know, if you're paying for that, you can probably afford it. Um, but I think probably people spend some money on products that they don't really need to. Um, under the skies that it's better. Um, especially I think I, I mentioned like moms and their kids. I think that's like an especially kind of messed up um scenario. Now, as a mom myself, there's just like so much mom guilt and stress around those kinds of choices. And often I just want to like tell all the moms, like, you're doing fine and your child is fine, you know, and he, he or she does not need the XYZ special fancy expensive brand when you, you know, can't afford it necessarily. Um, so I think that's one thing. It's messed up to be spending more money on these things that you don't necessarily need or that it's not doing what it says it's doing um, for you. And then the other piece I think is just kind of like building off that stress. Um, again, we know because we see clients and patients every day, stress around food is enormous um, for so many kind of pretty ridiculous reasons. And so the last thing we need is more stress, more anxiety, more second guessing. Um, and actually too, I mean, like nutritionally, I can't necessarily think of an example off the top of my head, um, but definitely it's influencing our nutrition choices, not just from a cost standpoint, um, but it's influencing maybe how much of a nutrient we're getting. Um, and that could be negative in some sense. Again, I, I could think of an example if I took long enough, but off the top of my head, I can't think of an exact, but for sure there's, there's choices being made every day because of marketing, because of those flashy colors or words or whatever you're seeing, or the person they're using advertising it um, that are impacting what choices you're making for better or for worse. And I think a lot of it's for worse. Yeah. It's, I feel like food is just such a constant conversation everywhere you go, whether it's like a social event or family gathering or whatnot. And then there's so much stigma around it. And like also so much comparison with like, how yeah. do you eat and like whatnot? I was having a conversation with a couple of coworkers the other day. And they were like ranting about the added sugar component and like yogurt or something and how the food industry is brainwashing us. And I was just so, I was like, we've got bigger issues here in the world. We're like, it's not that big of a deal. It's okay. But it was crazy to me, kind of like just even a professional setting where it's like a healthcare professional setting, things like this were happening. And I'm like, then you go into the grocery store and there's just so much there and for anyone who like has just like bare minimum education around nutrition it can be so overwhelming and you could be like very easily influenced because they they don't know that like terms aren't regulated on labels Absolutely. and you kind of see what someone's advertising on social media or you see what other people are doing and you're like should I be like guilty about what I'm choosing? This one seems healthier, but it's more expensive. That's out of my budget. It just, there's so much that goes into it. I feel like that stress component is huge. So many people will stress so much about food that yeah. it's not great. 
and I think like an example that's coming to mind to me um, for listeners, we've, we've said a few different things, but one instance is that food companies love buzzwords. And so there's so many examples right now of, you know, plant-based and anything that they're, anything that they can, they slap plant-based on, which we know there's a lot of gray area around what plant-based exactly means, but um, so they love putting plant-based on like things that are literally a plant. So like, yes, it is plant-based because it's a, it's a plant, you know, or like, okay, rice. Oh, your rice is plant-based. Oh, fantastic. Like every rice is plant-based. Um, Non-GMO, slapping non-GMO on things that can't be genetically modified. You know, the example I remember specifically was um, salt and salt is a mineral. It is, you know, it's not a living organism. It cannot be genetically modified. And that's just one, but like they do that all the time. They slap these labels on so people gravitate towards that and they choose those. It, and like, there's nothing different about that product. It's not better, it's not superior, um, but they don't know that. Have you guys seen the TikTok or the real, uh, it's food science babe who, shout out to her, she's amazing. Oh, love her. She's amazing. What does she say? She's like, there aren't any O's to M GMOs, like there aren't any <laughs> organisms to modify. I just thought of that, but yeah, GMOs is a big one. Emily and I always talk about that one. It's just so silly. I saw a TikTok yesterday, two days ago, whatever. Um, going back to the whole price point thing, it was all about gut health because gut health is a big thing right now. You know, we got to support our gut and have a happy gut and these gut health experts, which is not a real title, are telling us what foods to eat. And she was giving alternatives. They were like the heavy air quotes, if you're listening, not watching, heavy air quotes on the good versus bad, like Coke. So it was like Coke versus the Olipop. It was Ritz crackers versus like some other cracker that had no seed oils in it. And then a, a dietitian stitched it and was like, oh, shocker. Every alternative that she suggests is like way more expensive, which is almost always the case. And likely your gut health is going to be fine if you do enjoy Ritz crackers and Coke here and there. Like it's going to be, it's going to be okay. Right. Yeah. So we've talked about labels and kind of how many of there are out there and how there's not really a lot of regulation around them, but what kind of tips do you have for our listeners if they do want to shop smarter and might not be like fooled as easily by the marketing madness out there and kind of how can they navigate, I guess, like labels or like looking at labels, interpreting them from like a food standpoint. We also knocked supplements on there, but like, I feel like that's a whole nother question as well. <laughs> so we'll, we'll start with food. How can they kind of navigate that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there are a handful of labels that are regulated by the FDA. Um, not very many compared to the labels that are out there total. So I guess I would say like, it depends on your nutrition goals, um, of course. And so Ideally, you're working with a dietitian who could chime in on this too, but I know that that's not necessarily realistic or accessible for everybody. Um, but let's say you were trying to eat, you know, a little bit lower calorie or lower fat or something like that. Those sorts of labels, if it says low calorie, if it says low fat um, or no fat, like those, those are accurate. Like those are labels that have, you have to meet a certain criteria to use those labels on your product. Um, I'm not saying that everybody should go look for low calorie or low fat things, but if that matched your nutrition goals, um, that could be something you could trust, I suppose, uh, is what I mean there. And then past that, I guess a few tips I give people, one would just be to look, to look past a lot of those words for one, you know, not the ones I just gave the example, but the, some that we said earlier, right? Like natural and, um, science proven or, like I said, mom approved, doctor approved. Um, there's probably not even a comprehensive list out there, but I would just recommend like, look past some of those words. Um, look past the colors and the packaging and things like that. And another thing you can trust is the nutrition facts label. So, um, you know, that is regulated by the FDA. So if you're looking for something that has protein, I would encourage you to just 
flip it over and look at the protein um, because that's another really good example actually that I haven't mentioned is things love slapping protein on them and like absurd foods. Like I've definitely used a couple examples like protein peanut butter or protein um, cream cheese. Most of the time, those products have like a little bit more protein than their counterpart. You know, like protein peanut butter has eight grams instead of six or seven, like the normal one. And so is that worth the extra like $3? No, it's not. So I would say if you have nutrition goals and, and you're label savvy enough to kind of be looking for some of those things, look at the nutrition facts label, um, do the math, look at the serving size, you know, and, and figure out like, is that realistic? Like, could I get a good amount of protein from that? And go, go with that, whether it's carbs that you're looking for, whole grains that you're looking for, protein, like I said, maybe you're looking to do a little bit less added sugar. And I hate to, you know, demonize sugar because love me some sugar. Um, and I tell my athletes, like, we need carbs, we all need carbs. Um, and sugar are part of those carbs. But it's a fair goal that, you know, maybe you are trying to limit some added sugar in your diet. Um, if that's a goal of yours, you can look at that, like that's on the nutrition label. So those are just some examples of things you can trust and look for, and maybe that matches your goal. Um, and I would honestly just ignore a lot of the rest. Like, don't look at the packaging. Don't look at um, those words. Like I said, the colors, I would just be like really skeptical of those sorts of buzzwords, claims, et cetera, on the front of a package. And I tell people all the time, um, I, you know, there's a few examples. I think we all probably have our handful of name brands that we buy. Um, cause I don't know, we've been like brainwashed into thinking they taste different, but for the vast majority of products, the store brand is the same. In fact, like in many cases, it's the exact same. If you look at the ingredients and the label. Um, so if budget is something that you're considering, like a lot of people are consider that, you know, like pick, maybe you splurge on those couple of things that you think taste different and the rest of the things like go with the store brand, go with the cheaper brand, go with the bulk. I'm a big bulk fan. Um, and I don't have any visual way to show it on here, but that's another thing you can look for at the store. Um, on the price tag, you can actually find the, on the like bottom left or right corner, usually it'll say like price per unit or price per ounce or something like that. And you can compare and pick the cheaper one. Um, so I, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit, but I'm just trying to kind of visualize if I was going through the store. Those are some things I would look for versus disregard in terms of labeling around food. I think that's great advice. Like it definitely depends on the person and what their goals are, first of all. And then it's not helpful to like completely disregard nutrition and the label and what's on there, but a lot of it doesn't matter. And so it's just knowing what actually matters. So like, like you said, if your goals are to limit added sugar, that's going to be on there. You can like find objectively how much added sugar is in that product. Um, but if it says on the front of the label, maybe like keto doesn't automatically mean it's going to be like the best thing ever for you. For sure. And I guess too, I would add maybe one last consideration is do you like it? <laughs> yes. So many people buy crap they don't like or that they're not even really going to eat but they buy it because they feel like they should or they get enticed by that marketing and what a waste you know buy yeah. you should buy food you like and that you're actually going to eat like what if not what's the point so that should be a consideration too that's huge yeah. that's huge well one final question on this whole marketing madness topic I think I have a post of yours in my mind that might be one of my favorites, but in your opinion, what is the most outrageous hashtag marketing madness product that you have reviewed to date? If you had to pick one. I get asked this here and there and it's hard because they're all <laughs> so stupid. Yes. But in my mind, I have two, I have two that come to mind um, and I'll be interested if it's the one that you have, but one is the fast bar. So this is a granola bar that you eat to stay fasting. And so like literally the entire premise goes against its purpose because you cannot stay fasting if you eat food. Um, not that you should be fasting in the first place. That's a whole other thing. You don't need to be fasting. Um, 
but if you are you certainly can't eat a granola bar and it has like a, it had a very balanced macronutrient profile like it has some carbs protein and fat i'm unsure what about this would possibly make somebody think that they're fasting i think i said in the post like unless you open it and it like puts you to sleep and you you know you sleep for a few hours and that's why you stay fasting uh, i can't imagine what else about the package would keep you fasting so that's one and then the other um what because you said keto it's in my brain um a keto mayo which made me lol in the store when i saw it because if anyone's unaware keto or sorry it's mayo is keto inherently because it is pretty much 100 percent fat which falls right in line with a keto recommendation and again you don't need to be in keto either um but if you are you could use any mayo you wouldn't have to buy keto mayo so those are a couple examples that come to mind for me, but they're also dumb. They're also dumb. I was going to say keto mayo. That's what I was thinking of. I forgot about the fasted bar Same. thing. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so we always like ending our episodes with kind of, if you had to provide any final thoughts on all things marketing madness and leave our listeners with some final thoughts, exactly that. And they were, we always joke that like, they would only listen to this portion of the episode. What would you want them to take away from all of this? Mm. I think I would say, I kind of feel like I'm tempted to say what I just said a few minutes ago, which was like, ultimately you should buy food that you like and that you'll eat and that is nourishing. Um and I know that can be easier said than done with all the misinformation that, you know, we, we all process daily, but I think, yeah, and maybe it goes back to like, we've all seen the like memes or whatever floating around that are essentially saying the anxiety and stress caused by, you know, all the food misinformation out there is far worse for your body than any one or two or three or four foods could ever be is just like so true. Um, stress is so bad for your body in so many ways. So to stress about food in this way, um, it's just so silly. So yeah, I, I just would encourage people to choose food based on like what you need, what meets your budget um, and what will nourish you in like a really literal sense and maybe to like an emotional sense um here and there as well so I know that's not like building off any that's kind of building off what I already said but I think that's like my big drive home point if I could I think that's great I can see the Canva graphic already <laughs> yeah <laughs> cool all right well let's get into the final part of the episode our bonus question so we like to always end the episode with a fun little debate and today we're bringing it back to your sports rd roots Lauren so our bonus question today is, and we let you go first as the guest, what is the best sports drinks flavor? And maybe a part two to this, I didn't add in the, in the draft is what is like the best sports drinks, like brands, like Gatorade, Powerade, all that. Yep. So, I mean, I'm a Gatorade girl through and through. So that's for sure my go-to brand. And uh, it's, I'm probably going to say Riptide Rush. Wow. It's the light purple, but I have to throw in an asterisk that lemon lime, like the OG lemon lime is, is pretty real as well. And actually when I was pregnant, I did not have really like many cravings, like crazy cravings, but I did have a solid, probably like week and a half where I drank an absurd amount of lemon lime Gatorade and it just like happened naturally I was at work and of course we're surrounded by uh Gatorade at work and I had worked out and I like never get Gatorade after I work out I'm like you know a pretty casual exerciser these days so unless it's like really hot or something I don't usually grab Gatorade but I did I like fill up my cup like a little bit with lemon lime Gatorade and I was like oh my god that's delicious <laughs> and then I like fill up again like a little bit and a little bit more and then and this is a big cup and so then I filled it all the way up it was like for sure like 20 to 32 ounces so in that hour after I finished I drank like 64 ounces of lemon lime gator it was like a, it was like I was chugging it I was just like oh my god this is so good and then it lasted like a week like I went home and I was like 
told my husband, like, you have to go get me some lemon lime Gatorade. <laughs> and then I don't know, like after a week, it was kind of just over. And since then I haven't drank that much, but I feel like that like ties down to my roots, like somewhere deep down, obviously I love me some lemon lime. That is an amazing <laughs> stereotypical sports RD pregnancy crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so true. That's awesome. Well, I was going to say lemon lime too. I think that just deserves so much love. It's an amazing flavor. Like there's a reason why that's been like around probably since the very beginning of Gatorade's. It's so refreshing. Days. Yeah. You know, and that's what you want when you're an athlete who like is needing hydration is refreshment. Exactly. They just, yeah. they couldn't have gotten better from there. Okay. What's Emily. Yours, Emily. I, my favorite is, I don't know the name, but it's the light blue flavor. Ooh. I feel like, like it might be glacier blue. freeze. Oh, yeah. Oh, that sounds right. Yeah. I I associate that with like being sick. <laughs> that's <laughs> a that's positive sorry. memory for you. <laughs> I don't know. Every time I was sick, I was like, oh yeah, Gatorade. <laughs> and it was always that one. Um, and I'm surprised you had one answer. I know. I don't I think I'm very have... passionate about Gatorade. I, I like it a lot, but if I'm passionate, that's when I have multiple answers and I can't choose. <laughs> But this one, I was okay having one <laughs> firm decision. Also, I wanted yeah. to be like Lauren, so. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. <laughs> cool. So Lauren, if people want to hear more from you and they also want to learn and stay up to date on the marketing madness world, where can they find you? Like any social medias? You can really promote whatever you'd like at this point. So where can they find you? You can find me. Um, my handle is at link to nutrition. Um, I'm mostly on Instagram and Twitter. Um, I dabble on Facebook for like my mom mostly. Um, so I'm on that link to nutrition. And I also have a book, the healthy former athlete. If there's any former athletes listening who are struggling with transitioning, um, into what I call normal humanhood, uh, you could check that book out. It's on Amazon. Um, Barnes and Noble, Target, I think all have it online. So, um, but Amazon, I think is kind of the main hub and it's also a ebook. Um, so if that's interesting to anybody struggling with that transition, you could check that out too. Well, we will be sure to share all the links to all those things below so you guys can find them. Lauren, thank you so much for coming on today. This is going to be a great episode. We've not really discussed label reading much at all. So this will be a really good one. Um, but again, Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to this episode. We will see you next week. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in on this episode of The Upbeat Dietitians with your host, Emily Krause and Hannah Thompson. We appreciate you all so much for continuing to support us. In order to support us and sustain the success of this podcast, please subscribe and leave a rating and review. If you'd like to provide us feedback for future episodes and guest stars, follow us on Instagram at The Upbeat Dietitians. Lastly, you can show us support by providing a monthly donation using the link at the end of our bio. Once again, thank you so much for listening today and stay tuned next Wednesday for a new episode. Until then, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your week.